What's the difference between the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform? And here we've got the two equations. Here's the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. And already we can see they look very similar. They both are integrals from negative infinity to infinity of a function multiplied by an exponential. There, we can see here there's a scaling of 1 on 2 pi for the inverse Fourier transform. And we can also see there's a negative here for the Fourier transform and not for the inverse Fourier transform. But apart from that, they look very similar. So what is the difference? Well, let's address the scaling first of all. And that's simply because omega equals 2 pi f. So you can do a change of variables on this equation here, replacing the omega with with 2 pi f, and you'll be able to find out that that uh, disappears from that scaling when you write this using f. So that's where the scaling comes from, omega equals 2 pi f. What about this negative? Well, first of all, I want to make the comparison between the two functions and show just how similar they are. Even There's a way of showing it even more than this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make f be a, the input, I'm going to replace uh, f to be the input function, uh, the input function, and I'm going to use g to be the output function, and I'm going to use alpha to be the input variable, and I'm going to make beta be the output variable, and I'll show what I mean by this right now. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite the Fourier transform here using these functions in replacing these ones here. So I'm not going to call it frequency and time anymore and capital X for Fourier transform and little x for the time domain. I'm going to replace those by these more general functions. Okay, so G is the output function. So the output function here is capital X. I'm going to replace capital X with G. I'm going to replace omega with the output variable beta because that's the output variable of this equation. So now I'm thinking of these equations as input and output. You put in little xt as a function and you get capital X omega as an output. So let's write it in the more general form here. Okay, so this equals the integral from negative infinity to infinity of xt, which is the input function. So I write f, and it's a function of the input variable, which is t, but I'm now replacing that with alpha. Because in this equation, the input variable is t. So then I've got e to the minus j, and omega is the output variable, which we're replacing with beta, and t is the input variable, which we're replacing with alpha. So we have alpha, beta uh, in the uh, exponential, and then we've got d alpha, because alpha is the input variable, in this case it's t. So now we've got this equation here, which is the Fourier transform. This is exactly the same equation. All I've done is replace some variables, so it's still the Fourier transform. So now I'm going to write the inverse Fourier transform using the same replacement of variables. So in the inverse Fourier transform, this is the input function and omega is the input variable. This is the output function and t is the output variable. So now we've got the output function g, the output variable is t, which we're replacing with beta, and this equals an int 1 on 2 pi times an integral from negative infinity to infinity of the input function, which is f, with the input variable, which in this case is omega, so we're replacing that with alpha. Uh, and then we've got the exponential of minus j, oh, sorry, not the minus, of positive j times, and then omega is the input variable here, so that's going to be replaced with alpha, and t is the output variable replaced with beta, but again, we have them both, so we have alpha, beta, and again, d alpha, because the input variable is omega, which we're replacing with alpha. So now we have these two equations, which are exactly still the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. So now let's look at these two equations, and we'll be able to see that they really are very similar. We've got an output function, we've got an input function, they're the same, we've got integrals are the same, we've got the d alpha in both cases, and we've got the only difference here is that this has a negative and the inverse Fourier transform has a positive. Otherwise, it is exactly the same functional form.
uh, except for the scaling in the inverse Fourier transform. So I've made that change of variables to really highlight to you just how much they are the same. They are identical operations except for this negative here where this has a positive and except for the scaling. Okay, so let's try and understand why we've chosen the negative for the Fourier transform. We could have chosen to have a positive for the Fourier transform, but we've chosen a negative. So why did we choose the negative? So to do this, I just want to make go back to these, this form which we're more familiar with. So let me consider the case where xt equals 1. It's a constant. Well, in that case, the Fourier transform equals the integral from negative infinity to infinity of just e to the minus j omega uh, t dt. Okay, now what, how do, what is this integral? Let's think about that just for a minute. Well, what is this function here? This function here, e to the minus j omega t equals cos of minus omega t time, uh, plus j of sine of omega of minus omega t. Okay, and this equals, because the cos function is an uh, even function around the, the um, vertical axis, around the zero, this equals cos of omega t minus j of sine omega t, because that's an odd function. Okay, so this is a sinusoidal function, and this, we, and this is what's inside our integral here. And this is integrated from negative infinity to infinity of time. So, well, a cos function integrated over all time it's got an equal amount above the axis as below. So the integral over all time of this, if it's a cos function for any frequency, is going to be zero. The integral is going to be zero, except for if omega equals zero. So let's uh, just see why that is. I'll just plot a, the cos function here. Uh, the cos function looks like this, of course. And so if you're integrating over time, then the positive areas are going to cancel out all the negative areas and we do it forever for infinity. So this is equal to zero, except when omega equals zero. If omega equals zero, then cos of, of zero equals one. In this case, this integral is an integrating one from negative infinity to infinity, so that is going to equal infinity. So this and, and the sine function equals zero all the time, okay? So this equals, uh, we know that this equals, from what we've just said, it equals zero for all omega, ex uh, which except for zero. So if omega equals anything other than zero, then this integral equals zero. And this integral equals infinity if omega equals zero. Okay, we just saw that before. And so this is uh, the delta function. So this is a delta function at zero. This is where the delta function comes about. And I just want to make this point here before we consider a, back to this question about why there's a negative here. So to consider why there's a negative, let's look at that function there. If Let's look at the Fourier transform. If we put a basis function in. So here we put xt equals 1. Let's put a basis function. So let's put xt equals e to the j omega 1t. So we're going to pick a sinusoid, a complex sinusoid, at a particular frequency omega 1. Okay, then we've got the Fourier transform will equal negative infinity to infinity e to the j omega 1t times e to the minus j omega t dt. So that we've, all we've done is put that basis function into the Fourier transform. Now what we can do is we can collect the terms in the exponential. So we've got minus infinity to infinity, e to the j omega 1 minus omega times t dt. And now we see why there's important to have that negative there. It turns out that negative in the Fourier transform is just a convention. We could have chosen positive and had negative in the inverse, but we've chosen to have negative in the Fourier transform. And this is why, because now we can see this expression here looks exactly like this expression down here, except where here we only had omega, now we have omega one minus omega. So this integral follows exactly the same logic as the one we just did down here, except 
where we had omega down here, we now have omega 1 minus omega. And so what this means now is you can see by relating those two things, this answer here, we now have that this integral equals zero for all omega not equal to omega 1. So if when now we've got omega 1 minus omega not equal to zero, which means for all omega not equal to omega 1. And it equals infinity when, when here, this was when omega equals zero, but now it equals infinity when omega 1 minus omega equals zero. So that's when omega equals omega 1. So now we have a delta function at omega 1. And so if this is, if I plot this, this is omega, this is zero. So we now have a delta function at omega 1. Okay, so this now is the, I'll just draw that there to make it clearer. So now this convention, if we put the negative here, it means that by, this con, by, by having that negative there, it means that when you put a basis function in at omega 1, you get a delta function out at omega 1. If we didn't have that negative there and we had a positive, then the delta function would come out at negative omega 1. And that would be confusing. So in that case, if you put in this basis function with a positive omega 1, you would get a delta at negative omega 1 if you had a positive there. And that would be confusing. So to avoid that confusion, the convention is that the Fourier transform puts the negative in the Fourier transform. And then it doesn't have the negative, it has the positive in the inverse Fourier transform. But again, the functions are almost identical. The Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform are almost identical. And it's just a convention that says that we should put the negative in the Fourier transform uh, function. So hopefully this video has helped you to understand the relationship between the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, the very close relationship, and to see the important difference uh, and to understand more about that. If you found the video useful, please give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Uh, check out the details below the video where you'll find a web link to a web page which has a fully categorized list of all the videos on the channel. And of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos.